Hello everyone, welcome to the latest in this series of Anthropology Communicate, uh, Communicate seminars which is hosted by the RAI and organised by the RAI's Anthropology of Policy and Practice Committee. The Policy and Practice Committee was established to improve links between anthropologists and um, policymakers and practitioners. Um, the membership of the committee uh, straddle uh, the world of academia but also uh, applied work. So. Um, people working in um, the health sector or development or uh, civil service. Um, what unites us is um, we're all either anthropologists or we're passionate about anthropology and the potential of anthropology um, to contribute both understandings, but also to improve the world in which uh, we all live. Which brings us to the Anthropology Communicate seminar series, um, which we, um, we started organizing as a way of highlighting the uni unique perspective of um, that anthropology can provide, uh, the unique methods, and to thereby increase the potential influence of the discipline. Um, and also, um, it's an opportunity to encourage anthropologists to engage with different audiences in different settings and contexts, and by doing so, to, um, to bring about positive social impact um, in their work. Today's webinar, um, which I'm very excited about, it's a, a subject close to my own heart, is Anthropology Communicates in Schools and Colleges, a chance to consider the importance of community, communicating anthropological perspectives and methods to students in schools and colleges and non-university settings. And I'm, I'm very pleased to say we have four excellent speakers um, which, who, whose own um, backgrounds and experiences span a range um, of, 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 of um, perspectives. Um, and I'm going to introduce them now before we, we start. We have uh, Emma Ford, Secretary of the IUAES Commission on Anthropology and Education. Um, we have Professor, I'm just looking at the boxes. Um, we have Professor Joy Hendry, uh, Emeritus, uh, Professor of uh, Anthropology at Oxford Brooks uh, University, uh, but also um, uh, uh, Joy has worked uh, with the Scottish Qualifications Authority, um, contributing to curriculum development and supporting the teaching of anthropology in schools and colleges, especially colleges in Scotland. Um, and I think Joy also contributed to the now discontinued, sadly discontinued A-level uh, anthropology qualification in, in England. Uh, we have Kevin Purday, who teaches at uh, the Hockerill Anglo-European College. He's head of social and cultural anthropology. Uh, there, and also is workshop leader for social and cultural anthropology with the International Baccalaureate. So he'll be talking about the IB and uh, the curriculum and his role in developing that. And finally, we have uh, Dr. Thomas Love Marrick of Bentley Wood uh, High School in North London, um, where he's head, assistant head teacher and teaches sociology and psychology, but crucially integrates um, an anthropological perspectives and, and learnings in 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 his, all his teaching. He's also uh, the author of the book, Introducing Anthropology, along with Laura Pountney. Um, a really good introduction to anthropology, and I would recommend it to, um, to people interested in the discipline, um, not just uh, young people, anyone. And it's a, a very nice primer as well. I've, I've enjoyed dipping in there um, for subjects I'm interested in. The format today um, is for the panel. Um, to give short presentations of about 10 to 15 minutes, and then we'll have plenty of time, not so much to have questions and answers, so please do ask questions. You can do that either through the chat or by uh, raising your, your, your virtual hand on Zoom, um, but also to share experiences. So we're really interested in hearing from, um, from everyone uh, about your experiences or ideas uh, for promoting anthropology in schools and colleges. Um, so without further ado, I will hand over to Emma. I think Emma, you're going to use a PowerPoint. So if you just want to be bringing that up. Great. So I am the secretary of the IUAS Commission on Anthropology and Education. And the IUAS stands for the International Union of Anthropological and Ethnological Sciences. And the Education Commission brings together people from around the world for things like panels, symposia and workshops. Additionally, from 2014 until early 2021, I was the Education and Communications Officer at the Royal Anthropological Institute. So I worked on outreach events, teaching resources and qualification development. 
So drawing on these experiences, I'm going to take us on a journey through the landscape of anthropology and education to situate anthropology in schools and colleges within that. So the IUAS Commission on Anthropology and Education was created in 2015. And since that time, the commission has grown to over 250 members in 30 countries. And we've held panels and workshops at conferences in different countries from Belgium to Brazil. And our commission has two big foci. So the first is anthropology in education, which is what we're talking about today, the teaching and learning of anthropology. And also as more members have joined, we've expanded that remit to also look at the anthropology of education. And so that is um, research studies of educational settings. And this distinction was made in this way by the late Brian Street. Um, and he always argued that we can learn a lot by looking at anthropological studies of educational contexts that can help inform how we teach anthropology in education. So where is anthropology taught and learned? Well, it is taught and learned internationally. I know we've got members of the International Commission here with us today, so I hope to hear from them later. Um, and within that, you have three big areas. So you've got schools and pre-university colleges, that's one. You also have the community and you have universities. So if we take a closer look at schools and pre-university colleges, uh, this is available in different countries, but I'm going to focus today just on the UK. And so the formal qualifications where you can currently study anthropology are the SQA, SQA units, which Joy will be talking about. And you can also study anthropology within the International Baccalaureate, which Kevin will be talking about. Additionally, there used to be an anthropology A-level, and this is something I know Tomislav and Joy are going to touch on further. So we also have informal ways of teaching and learning anthropology. So this could be in school clubs, uh, after school clubs, maybe with hominid casts or people giving presentations or having visiting speakers and also events. So these could be uh, in collaboration with nearby universities, um, or they could be on a larger scale. There's also uh, what we've often referred to as the Trojan horse method. So this is the teaching of anthropology within other subjects. So for example, if you're teaching biology, you might draw on the anthropology of human evolution, or similarly for history or sociology, you may find ways to bring anthropology into other subjects. So moving on to the community, anthropology is taught and learned in museums and through public exhibitions. It's also available in short courses. These could be online or they could be offline, so face-to-face. -face. There's also self-teaching. So there's books out there you can pick up if you have no knowledge of anthropology. There are podcasts, there are videos, and you can teach yourselves aspects of this subject. And also there's families and friends. And I wanted to include this because it's another way that we teach and learn anthropology. We tell people about what we're studying or what we've studied in the past. Lastly, there's a the university. And within the UK, this would be broadly conceptualized for the students as bachelor's, master's, PhD. But thinking beyond that, many universities also provide summer schools and some of those are anthropology specific. Uh, and these might be again, opportunities for a 16 to 18 year old to have a little taste of anthropology, see if it's for them. They also, um, in some cases, offer continuing education courses. So this would be for lifelong learners. Again, this can be in person or online. And I have also heard instances of aspects where there are anthropological elements in general teacher training. So if they're teaching teachers who will become humanities teachers, there may be elements of anthropology within that in certain countries. So I'm giving you this map basically to highlight that the schools and the colleges fit within this and they don't stand alone. But each of these settings brings their own challenges and opportunities. So let's say you want to create a new anthropology course, a new event or an activity or a resource. We really need to think about balance because we might have some wonderful ideals. We might want to get our students doing lots of fieldwork experiences, for example, for understandable reasons. But then we also need to marry that with the reality of the educational systems we're working in. How often can we take students out of school? 
those kinds of things. So there's often kind of an ideal and real bouncing that goes on. Another aspect to consider it would be the local context. So I've noticed these three areas often will influence either how easy it is to introduce an anthropological course or project or theme. Um, and these are the public awareness, the career prospects and the education system. So you can understand that if there's a country where anthropology is much more well known, people are on the news talking and they are an anthropologist, that would also feed back and perhaps make it more likely that the education system will be more open to bringing anthropology into its group of subjects. Equally, you can see how there's a relationship between the education system and then career prospects because employers are more aware of anthropology as a discipline, the skills that people develop. So I think what's interesting is it's not just a static thing either. So something may be very receptive at a particular point in time and then a little later down the line, this situation will change and it's no longer quite as a conducive environment. So let's say you're looking at existing examples of teaching and learning anthropology outside universities. You're looking around for inspiration. What kind of questions can we ask? Well, who are the teachers and who are the learners? What are they teaching? Where are they teaching? Why are they teaching anthropology? And why should we even teach anthropology in the first place? And then this last question, how, is one I'm going to focus on a little bit more now. Uh, it's something I'm particularly interested in myself. And I think it's quite interesting when we're considering communication. So how can we best design learning experiences for the learners we're actually going to encounter? Getting a clear picture of who the learners are. So how many students will there be in a class? What will their range of abilities be like? What do their textbooks look like? What scaffolding are they going to need to help them if they're of different abilities? So designing learning so they can learn in a social way as well. So this could be something as easy as turning to your neighbor and talking about your home life or experiences or rituals that you might do in your particular communities, or it could be using technology, connecting with another class in another part of the world. But there's certainly a social aspect of learning anthropology, which it's always beneficial to include. And something I think is quite useful to use as a way of thinking is this well-known framework, Bloom's Taxonomy, which was revised in 2001. And it's for designing learning objectives for a class or course. It's very well known in the world of education. But if you look to the bottom of this pyramid, you've got remember. So you need to recall facts and basic concepts. Moving up from that, then you're understanding. So you're explaining ideas, you're classifying, you're describing. Up again a level, you're applying that knowledge to new situations. Up again, you're analyzing, you're drawing connections between different ideas. Up again, you're evaluating, you're justifying, or you're making a decision. And lastly, you're creating and producing new and original work. So all the way up this pyramid, you're finding ways to apply anthropology more and more to sort of the real world. And that will probably be more beneficial in the long term, but you need to build up from the bottom. So you could take something like kinship, you need to remember this kinship term, you need to understand it with a kinship system, then can you apply it to your local community and so on. Another aspect of how we teach and learn is of course, the way we communicate it. So education is mediated by language. And it's important to not let the words we use become a barrier. There are ways to adapt and wrap academic texts so they can still be accessible, perhaps to students with lower reading levels. So I know that, for example, the International Baccalaureate have consulted with their IB teachers um, about a particular reader they were developing. And the teachers gave them great feedback saying, can we include a glossary here? Could we introduce some extra scaffolding to help students take what they've learned and put this into an essay, so prompts for different part of the essays. So it's a really good idea to actually engage with both the teachers and if possible the learners to learn how you can best design a resource, an activity or a course. So this concludes the how section. If you've enjoyed what I've talked about and you'd like to be involved in 
further discussions after this webinar, um, I would warmly invite you to consider coming to the IUAS Congress in Yucatan. It's happening in Mexico, but it's happening online. So our commission has several panels and a round table. So we have the Anthropology of Educational Settings, New Trends and Challenges, uh, convened by Joy and Boris, who are both here today. We also have Heritage, an Educational Challenge for World Citizens. We have Afterlives of Education and the Revision of Aspirations. And a round table about learning and living nowadays, and that's in honour of Jean Lave. So for more details, we're going to pop that into the webinar chat. You can find out more about that. And also, if you'd like to join the Commission mailing list, please do drop me an email, education.iuaes at gmail.com. And we also have a link going into the chat so you can sign up on a form. Great. That's all from me. Thank you for listening. And I look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you, Emma. Um, really interesting to get that, that wider perspective um, of, of all that's going on on um, both anthropology of education and anthropology in ed education. Um, hopefully you can bring that, um, that link up to the, the Congress, the IUAES Congress in Yucatan. Um, and so if people want to find it, it's in the chat. Um, and as we said, if you want to post any questions or points in the chat, you're welcome to do so. Um, now or, or indeed later. Um, next up, um, we have uh, Dr. Kevin Purday, who will also be reflecting on a sort of more, the, the widescreen um, international teaching uh, of anthropology, and is also using a PowerPoint and a film. And I'm not quite sure what order that's coming up. Are we using the PowerPoint first and then the film? Yes, please. Very excited about the film. I've seen a little bit of it and it's, it's really good, great stuff. Over to you, Kevin. Thank you very much, Richard. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, the IB has been going for over 50 years um, and social and cultural anthropology ha has been a part of it ever since the birth of, of the IB. Uh, and it's part of the International Baccalaureate because it's always regarded social anthropology as being pretty essential to the type of education which the IB uh, is trying to offer. We used to have many, many schools doing the International Baccalaureate in the UK. That number has dropped enormously, but IB social anthropology is taught all over the world, literally everywhere over the world. Uh, the USA is probably the biggest center in the world for, for the IB, uh, but it is taught absolutely everywhere. Now, I'm going to talk just about the social and cultural anthropology syllabus. I hope I'm not going to bore you. So do, do forgive me if I'm saying things which you're not going to find particularly useful. For those of you who don't know the IB, uh, students have to do for the IB diploma, they have to study uh, their own language and literature. They have to study at least one foreign language. They have to do a social science, a humanities subject like social anthropology. They have to do a, a science subject. They have to do maths uh, and they have a free choice uh, as well. So they have to do six subjects. Uh, they also do um, theory of knowledge, uh, which is a sort of um, about what we know, what we think we know, what we know we don't know, what we don't know that we don't know type of subject. Uh, and they also have to do a creative, active and service program uh, where they, for example, they can do dance, they can work with a charity, they can work with a food bank, uh, they can do sport and all sorts of things as well. So it's a very broad education. It's a much less narrow one, but it's, it's very similar to the educational, uh, the education that goes on in six forms uh, around the world. So I'm, I'm going to very briefly try to take you through what we do. Um, what we do is um, we start off by looking at what are called the six big anthropological questions. And, and these are, are, are really important ones. And I, and I don't know about you, but I, I feel passionately that social anthropology is something absolutely vital in the world that we live in. If, we, if everybody studied social anthropology, we wouldn't have half as many problems as we have in the world today. So these six big anthropological questions, most schools teach them uh, in the first term, but then of course they crop up throughout the whole syllabus as well. 
language, as Emma was saying, is incredibly important. And, and there, are, there are nine key concepts. There's a glossary of, of a whole pile of them uh, between 100 and 200 words, but these nine key concepts form a sort of framework that crops up all the way through the syllabus. Very, very important. Now, for those people who do higher level, because you can either do it as a higher level or a standard level, the higher level is, is, is equivalent to the full A level. The standard level is more similar to what used to be the AS level. For the higher level people, they have to do anthropological theory and schools can do whatever they want to. I've just put up on the screen for you uh, 14 uh, that are, are really useful and very interesting. And they have to learn anthropological theory, not just for an examination paper, but they need the theory for their own field work, which they have to do uh, as part of the syllabus. Uh, they also have to learn about uh, anthropological ethics, really interesting, again, not just for the examination paper, but also for their own field work, which they have to carry out. They learn about fieldwork methods, both higher and standard, although the higher have to do much more detailed stuff. Uh, and these are the sorts of things that we, we, we help them to do. The IB allows us to do visual anthropology, although at the moment we can't do film because they don't have a way of uploading it, but a lot of students use um, photography, for example, uh, in their field work. Now, the, the main body of it uh, is choosing what are these called nine areas of inquiry. Higher level people, it's recommended that they do four of them, so one from each group and a fourth one from any of the groups. Uh, standard level people tend to do the three, one from each of the groups, and teachers can choose whatever they want to. So, for example, I, I teach the body, which is a, I find an absolutely fascinating one, starting at the hair and working all the way down and ending up with prosthetics and robots and all sorts of things. I find it fascinating. Uh, we also teach belonging, a really, really important one, and we also teach conflict. And then for the higher level one in, in, in my school, we do health, illness and healing, which is something that I specialised in uh, when I was a student myself of social anthropology. But, te but teachers have enormous freedom to choose what they want to out of all that, so they, they can use it to express the things that they're passionate about for the students as well. We're very much... Um, encouraged to look at real world issues. Sometimes this could be quite depressing because a lot of the things that are going on are, are rather negative, uh, but it's really important. And in the exam, uh, they have to bring in a, a real world example from the time that they've actually been studying. So we try and bring these things in all the way through as we're teaching those areas of inquiry. Uh, and in the exam, five of those will actually crop up uh, and they can choose which then they want to. Um, now for the higher level field work, uh, which the students, by the way, absolutely adore. It's one of the major reasons why students choose to do social anthropology. So in my school, which is an ordinary state comprehensive school in the UK, I have normally... <laughs> I normally have somewhere in the region of between 90 and 100 students doing social anthropology. I've got nearly 50 in my year 12 and I've got 40 in, in, in my year 13. Uh, thank you. Most of them do a uh, higher level because they want to do the field work. Uh, they make a presentation, the students make suggestions, they then write their critical reflection. They then do their field work. So far, my students, for example, have done their field work in 52 different countries. It's, it's really wonderful what, what they do. And then they write up their report, uh, they give their findings. Most of the marks go to the analysis of the findings and the evaluation of what they did, how well it went, what they might do differently, and so on. Uh, for standard level people, they do something a little bit simpler. They start off with an observation a passive observation, uh, and then they extend that with uh, actually going and interviewing or doing a survey or whatever, and then they actually write all that lot up as well. So both do field work, but the standard level do field work was a little bit simpler. The, 
the examination uh, is basically, uh, as I put up on the screen for higher level there, uh, they do three compulsory questions on an unseen text, and then the higher level people uh, have a, an ethical question to answer. They all have one of the six big anthropological questions to answer, and they have to bring in ethnographies to actually answer those questions. And then in paper two, uh, they've got to actually do um, something on a, a real world issue as well, bringing in an ethnography to answer that as well. Now, whilst I'm talking about ethnographies, uh, this is one an, an interesting thing. They have to actually have a, a great deal of technical information about the the ethnography in, in many ways, more than we would ask them to do at university. They have to actually know who wrote the ethnography, uh, where the field work was undertaken, what the dates of the field work were, what the purpose of the field work was, uh, and what exactly was going on. So that's a very important part about that. So, this is just an example of an ethnography. This is a fairly recent one done by a young lady from the University of Amsterdam. Uh, she did her field work last year uh, on the COVID-19 and the reaction of Sri Lankan people to COVID-19. She did it for six weeks, the field work, and this is all the details. So that is something very special about the requirements of, of the IB. Now, if, if there are any questions that you'd like to ask when we go into our, our, our chat and so on, you're most welcome to ask questions uh, and find out more about what we actually do in social anthropology. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I, while we're waiting for, I think we're having the, are we having the film now, Hanine? Um, yes. But, um, can I just mention as well, I think there was a bit of feedback. I don't know if it was me or if someone has their, their Zoom unmuted. Um, but if if uh, if you could leave, yes. you could leave your, your Zoom muted just while we have the presentations, uh, and then if we have um, questions later, I'll ask you to unmute mute then. I think it was some. It sounded like we had some maybe young potential converts to anthropology out there. <laughs> um, but thank you, Kevin. That was that was really interesting to just see the the, the range and scope of of, of the IB uh, anthropology program and um, the value of it as well. And as you say, I think if if anthropology was more widely taught, um, perhaps we would see more empathy and ethics in in, in regard to these real world issues. Um, are we going to see the film? I'm very excited about the film. Yes, I'm I'm ready to show it now. Okay, great. Are. Let's see the film. Lovely. Okay. All right. So at the beginning of year 12, what interests you to do IB social and cultural anthropology? Anthropology. Did it meet your expectations? So at the beginning, actually, I chose to do business management. And then after a couple of months, I decided to switch with Token. I think that Token is a really interesting question. I think that Token is a really interesting subject because in that way you can study pretty much everything. Each day you're going to study something different about the world and actuality, so it's never going to be boring. And this reputation was fully respected. And at the same time, I thought it was really interesting because you can have a really interesting debate with other people, and so you can hear different voices of different kind of people, and so you even learn how to have like a respectful debate. Uh, describe your field work. Um, so I'm researching why young people dye their hair, because I dyed my hair, so I'm not really sure why I'm doing this, it's just fun. So I wanted to understand more, so I'm looking into like peer pressure and like beauty standards kind of, that kind of thing. Yeah. My field work? Uh, my field work is, <laughs> is looking into the, uh, the drinking cultures of both Italy and the UK and comparing the impact of alcohol on the youth and society. Do you have a favourite ethnography? Yeah, well, I have two actually. The first one is covered in ink, which is the one I used for my for my not for my film work. And then I also very really like my ethnography made by Ganya. And I like this because it focuses on something on minorities on how minorities kind of cope with an urban environment in which they feel out. And I think it's a very important topic to to focus on. What other skills have you learned from anthropology that can be applied in other means in life? 
Um, so like I said earlier, you can be open-minded, so I feel like I can communicate better, especially in the classroom. There's many different perspectives, and it's really interesting to hear and understand this. Describe anthropology in one word or in one phrase. I think anthropology could be defined as the study of people, probably. Fascinating. Uh, I would say anthropology is the study of differences. It's eye-opening. <laughs>
and then you go to search and type in social anthropology and the units come up. So the first one um, I uh, introduced is, was to get students to think about the, their place in the world. And Scotland, as um, people may know, has um, a large number of contacts in the outside world. So it's estimated that while Scotland has a population of 5 million, the world has a population of people who call themselves Scottish or who have of Scottish descent of 20 million. So there are lots of people who like to think that they're still um, related to Scotland. And that means that people in Scotland are talking to people around the world and even through lockdown, they were talking on Skype and uh, FaceTime and things of that sort. And so you can meet people who know people in other parts of the world, but you don't meet many people who know what anthropology is. And I like Kevin, I think it's a great subject for people to know about. And so to have the students think about their place in the world was a good way to start. So what they do in the very basic unit that they start with is they think about three things. They think about who are the people who are close to them. And the teachers were very inventive and devise where well, they don't do exams. They do, they gather information, put it into things like blogs or bring it into the class and discuss it, and then gradually get uh, um, assessed on what they've produced from their own work. So they got them drawing diagrams with the people. So they'd have themselves in the middle, ego, and then people who were close to them and what those relationships meant to them. So they started out with people. The second thing they look at is objects and students would bring objects into the class and discuss what was important to them and why they were important, which tended to bring in ideas about ritual. And then the third thing was where they belonged. So you can see we're using some of the same concepts as the IB, but at a very um, introductory level in the first year. Uh, then uh, the students are encouraged to compare with each other what they've found and to see what the differences might be. And they make contact with students in other uh, countries as well as reading ethnography and reading about people. And the teachers again were very inventive. And when I went to one uh, school, or maybe it was a college, to see what I go, I get to go and see what the students have produced, a sample of their work and sometimes their presentations. So it's really interesting to see what they've come up with. And um, in one case, the students uh, had read about rites of passage in other parts of the world. They thought these were really fun. So they devised possible rites of passages that they would like themselves to go through in order to become adults. And just as an aside, I was trying to persuade BBC Radio Scotland to interview more anthropologists because it seemed to me that in Scotland people are sympathetic towards the subject. They do display a lot of tolerance of, of people from other backgrounds. They're very welcoming to refugees, for example. And um, they say that they learn about these things in, in subjects like religious education. Um, but not many anthropologists are interviewed on the radio, and I thought that would be a good way to do it. So one morning I phoned in as a phone-in program when the person running it was talking about the problems of youth. And I said that these rites of passage that the students had come up with would be really good. And before I had a chance to say anything much at all, the woman said, oh, well, all the Scottish students go off to Magaluf for a rite of passage. So uh, she put me in my place. <laughs> they know what to do. They go and uh, find themselves in a, um, a holiday. Anyway, that's the first unit. And the students that I visited seem to really be enjoying it. They take photographs and videos and bring them in for the um, uh, assessment. And they uh, do a lot of uh, interviewing of their own families. Uh, so that's also quite good because it means they're taking the word out to the wider world. The second unit, which um, is called what social anthropology, what, who does it and how do they do it? So it's raising Emma's question again. Um, so we, we talk about methods, or they talk about methods, but they also, one of the main roles, uh, main tasks in that unit is to find people who are anthropologists or have anthropological training and see what they're doing in the world. And the idea is to see what kind of careers they could take up with a knowledge of anthropology. And I was very impressed that the students found all sorts of people in all kinds of walks of life. So for example, international business, finance, journalism, diplomacy, sport, tourism, uh, local politics in the um, uh, uh, Scottish uh, representative in the British Parliament, 
in Dundee, the anthropologists, for example. So um, they, they were really good at finding them. And I thought that was a really important part of what I wanted the schools and colleges to be doing, which was uh, in helping students to find how they could use anthropology in their future careers and how they could convince the people who might be interviewing them that, that this training would be a good part of their, their curriculum detail. Um, the third one is what uh, um, Kevin mentioned, which is the anthropology of the body. And uh, oh, actually, sorry, the second one, I just wanted to mention one more thing, because the other, another thing the students are asked to do is to look at how social anthropology might contribute to contemporary global concerns, such as threats to the environment, large numbers of displaced people, and the implications of advances in robotics. And some of the students have picked up on my interest in Japan. And in Japan, um, there are robots becoming parts of the family, looking after elderly people. It's, they're very common. So that was a, a nice subject that some of the students took up. Um, the third one's about the body, the life course, and tattoos are very popular in Scotland as elsewhere. So uh, tattoos, hairstyle, dress, all kinds of things. And the students uh, like to look at those aspects. Of course, they're all doing theory as well, well, some theory, but uh, I'm emphasizing the, the ways in which they get involved in the subject. Uh, the relations between humans and animals is a nice one that they look at in that one. Um, and uh, they also have a quite a nice unit where they create um, uh, robots or avatars and look at the, the characters that are created in computer games. As, as a way of thinking about anth the anthropological approach to that. And the last unit, which uh, so far has only been taken up, I think, because it's the highest level. Um, we're now at the, in Scotland, the equivalent of the A level is the higher. And you've got hires and advanced hires. And the advanced hire is the first year of university. And that uh, unit is called Scottish Ethnographies. And so what I'm encouraging the students to do when I wrote that unit is to look around themselves and see what diversity there is within Scotland. Um, and it's very good for at the moment because the Scots language is being valued and people are getting prizes for writing it in their literature and in poetry. And so to find examples of your own various um, uh, uses of Scots language is, is a good way that students can learn about language, not only foreign languages, as you do in the IB, but also the different Scots languages. And I, I think I'm getting some encouragement from Gaelic speakers, although I haven't seen any units yet in the Gaelic speaking um, in, in parts of the University of the Highlands and Islands where they do Gaelic medium programs. But there is definitely interest, and I think this is coming up quite soon, from the northeast of Scotland, where a language called the Doric is still spoken. Um, the uh, Four units bring students to, uh, if they take them all, and so far, uh, one of the things we thought of that I should mention is that with the A-level, it was an A-level or not an A-level, a first year or a second year. With these units, you can add them to all your other courses. So it's social sciences is an obvious one, and it's part of the way you qualify for social sciences higher. Uh, religious education is another one, that, because apparently some of the teachers did anthropology, and they like to introduce it. And um, there's something which in Scotland is called modern studies and introduces politics and history and uh, anthropology fits in there too. So we wrote the units specially so that they could be infiltrated. It's a little bit like Emma's Trojan horse. They can be infiltrated into all sorts of other disciplines and people can learn the value of anthropology without uh, taking it as a whole higher, which you can't yet do, although some teachers are asking for it. Um, we had a lot of support from the four universities, as I mentioned, when we were putting the units together. There was a committee, which also included Emma, and we all um, sat and uh, discussed the, the way the units would work. What I uh, saw by going around, I'm the external verifier now, so I get to go and see what they're doing, um, was that people were finding the subjects very um, uh, popular and very good. They were drawing in adult students into college classes, which was good. And, and I'm looking forward to seeing what happened during lockdown, because at the beginning of lockdown, when uh, teachers were having to teach remotely, um, I was, and they had the problem of exams, and actually the Scottish Qualifications Authority has been 
asked to redevise, devise, redesign itself, um, especially for the point of view assessment, because there was a lot of complaint about that. Um, and we didn't have exams. So I was arguing, well, anthropology can do those without exams and do this and do that. So now I've found myself on a, a committee of, um, I think I'm called a, um, an advisory friend or something to help redesign the course. So that's what we do in Scotland. And again, if you'd like to, it's just one example in one, uh, one nation and how people can look within their nation and put, make comparisons with the outside world. So if you have any questions, please come back to me. I will try to answer them. Thank you, Joy. And, and can I also just thank you for suggesting um, this as a topic for uh, one of these Anthropology Communicates webinars. You actually wrote to me, I think, after one of the previous ones. And I'm so glad you did because um, it's such a fascinating topic. And, and one of the things I've, I've, I've you know, realised from, from the descriptions um, that you and, and Kevin have given of, of uh, teaching and promoting curriculum development in, in, in schools and colleges is just how much you've learned from doing so. You know, it's, and I think that's one of the things about anthropology. We, we, we both teach and learn, we share knowledge um, and, and we enjoy doing so. So it's been really nice. So thank you, Joy, for that. If anyone else um, has any suggestions for future anthropology webinars, I'm, I'm very um, keen to learn. So I'm very keen to, to hear. Um, so uh, we, I, we certainly have upcoming sessions on, I think, tourism, politicians, climate change uh, and marketing. Uh, or business might be another one. Uh, but if you have any ideas, and do get in touch with me through the chat or um, through the RAI. And um, yeah, very keen to hear that. Uh, but back to today, um, our final teacher. We, we've talked about um, Trojan horses. Um, I'm not going to push that metaphor too much because I know how the Trojan horse ended. Um, but this idea of, of teaching anthropological methods or perspectives and, and, and sort of integrating them into other disciplines. And anthropology is a, is a a discipline or an approach that that does sit well with other disciplines it informs other approaches and, and enters into conversations i think very effectively with them um so our final speaker is thomas love who um previously did teach on the anthropology a level in england um and he's very much still in, involved as an anthropologist in that uh, but in a slightly different way so thomas love if you want to share your slides with us Thank you, Richard. Um, hello, everybody. I am really happy to be sharing my experience of teaching anthropology in secondary schools. I'm just trying to see why is it not allowing me to share my... We can see it. We can oh see God. them. Uh, you can see the... Uh... Not anymore now, but we did see them a moment ago. Okay, so... Try again. I'll let you know. Yes, they're up. Okay, so you can see it now, yeah? Yeah. Okay, so uh, it's a pleasure to be invited for this talk, and I would like to share with you a little bit of my experience of being in secondary schools and teaching this beautiful subject that we all love. Um, so the school that I teach at the moment is uh, Bentley Wood High School. You can see the aerial view of this beautiful setting here. It's set in 23 acres of the woodland. This is a rarity in Northwest London to have a secondary school in such setting. This is a state school. And it's also all girls uh, school. Um, the characteristics of this school is that uh, it's about 1400, uh, 1400 students in a school and mainly they come from the Asian countries. Um, most of them are either second or third generation of uh, refugees uh, from, from these Asian countries. Uh, what I discovered is that there are about 37 different languages spoken in my school. As uh, A-levels, we offer sociology, government politics, psychology, history. Um, at, at some point in the past, we also had a level anthropology. I'm going to give you just a brief overview about how it worked and what it was. Uh, Emma and Joy mentioned a little bit about it was um, in 2010 after really 
uh, hard efforts by the educational committee at Royal Anthropology Institute that A-level anthropology was introduced in English uh, secondary schools. And I was really excited and started teaching from its beginning. What you can see here is the four units that we were teaching at that time. Uh, in the first year, uh, we were teaching unit one, uh, which was being human unity and diversity. Um, in this is the, in, in the only in this unit, there was a little bit of biological anthropology. Most of the time it was a cultural anthropology. The second unit in the first year was relating to um, identity and becoming a person. So you complete this first year and then if you choose to, you can get a grade on its own that you can cash for university or you can continue for a second year. In second year, we were teaching unit three, which was globalization. And unit four, same like Kevin is saying, the most exciting part is um, conducting a little mini field work that they had to actually write it and then answer the questions on it. Sadly, it was discontinued. I'm not going to go into politics of this, but in 2018, 2019 was the last uh, time that I was teaching it in, in a school itself. However, I think by having A-level anthropology in England, I think it initiated lots of different projects. Uh, not only like Joy was saying that it started and it's going really well in Scotland, but it opened the avenues for many different courses that uh, uh, different teachers and different schools can use anthropology for. Now, I don't have to share with you what are the benefits and what are the things that we can teach anthropology about, especially at the moment, these new generations looking at the uh, immigration and uh, racism, environmental crisis, uh, globalization, inequality. I mean, this point of inequality, class, age, gender, social class, um, we have just received instructions from the government and from the Ofsted. This is the inspections in the United Kingdom, but we have to touch upon these personal characteristics throughout the school in different ways. So anthropology does speak to definitely to the present moment where we are uh, living at the moment and students, my students can relate to it. This is just some of the examples of the ways that I was teaching them and the ways that they were learning about. Yes, we are lucky to live in beautiful London where we are exposed to so many different cultures, so many different languages, but also places that we can take our students to uh, either conduct their uh, surveys, interviews, or visit museums. Um, one thing what I found with uh, uh, teaching anthropology is the support that I was receiving from all of the um, anthropologists and universities, especially in the United Kingdom. Um, and the way that we were learning was through role plays, displays, presentations, uh, films, uh, watching ethnographies, it was really, really fun and it was very popular. Anthropology was something special in a, any school, in secondary school in England. As I said, sadly, it was discontinued 2018. Um, it was really big fun and my students were the best kind of uh, salesmen in a school for the future generations. Now, losing the uh, A-level anthropology I was a little bit lost for a year or so because it wasn't, uh, I, I teach sociology and psychology as well. So during the COVID pandemic and last year, I decided to introduce the anthropology club to little ones, to young, to small people. Uh, so this, uh, this is year, original year eight, uh, year nine now. Uh, year eight is uh, 12 years of age and uh, I've introduced the anthropology as a club that is run uh, once a week. And it was very successful throughout the year. <clears throat> so when we started face-to-face um, -face, uh, in sometimes after Easter this year, they couldn't wait to start to come to, to, to this club. So once a week we <clears throat> meet up during the lunchtime and then we discuss different things. 
I told them that I'm doing this presentation. So they said to me, sir, why don't we do a presentation for you? So what you see in the next few slides is what they put it up. I said, so why don't you tell them what have you learned the past year, something that you can share with them. So these are the things that, that they put together in <coughs> this uh, PowerPoint. Uh, and this was a uh, kind of idea behind this PowerPoint is to introduce it and to invite other year groups because during the COVID we had to keep within a bubble. So each year had to stay within their own year group. Now, starting in September, uh, students are allowed to mix. So uh, this two days ago, we had the first anthropology society. We changed the name to anthropology society and we invited year 12. So year 12 is uh, 17 years of age. And my year nines, this group of students, they were the ones who were telling them about what we have learned. And uh, they really enjoyed it. We, we usually start with body modification, which is very uh, kind of uh, intriguing when you show them images and pictures of, of different cultures and the reasons behind it. Um, that is not shocking anymore. I always introduce aspect of biological uh, anthropology because this links very much to issues of ethnicity and race and racism and uh, uh, it's very serious uh, topics that uh, those students of 12 years of age that they can talk about. Um, one, of the, one of the kind of activities that I do with them is that can you recollect and remember the first time that you became aware that you are of different ethnicity or something? And it just made them stop and think and reflect. And they were so open about it. Uh, uh, some very positive uh, experiences that they had. Another activity, I mean, this club is so much fun because um, there is no, I said to them, there is no homework. But uh, somehow I said to them, there's no homework. I always give them a little bit to read. They do a little presentation. We do uh, something that kind of encourages them to, to learn some of the concepts in anthropology. For this one, we, for languages, we made up our own language. So we created about a bank of about 30, 40 words that only we can communicate between ourselves. So when they see me outside during the lunch or break time, they say a couple of the words that only we understand and we didn't share it with, with nobody. We wanted to see where our food come from. And I, I reflected this by looking at the subsistence patterns and looking at the, um, how, how uh, different societies provide uh, uh, food for, 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 for themselves. And one last, I don't know, I don't think you can uh, play this week because they are into TikTok and uh, Snapchats and everything. They said, okay, so let's make a little TikTok. We have a, our school has a TikTok uh, uh, thing that they, that we share. So they recorded uh, something about hunters and others that we have performed with little music and in the background and so on. Interesting thing when we talk about identity and kinship, we always like to do a family tree. And this is the example of what they were making th those little uh, connections. Some of the families are bigger than the others. They um, try to understand their place. And I make them kind of interview their grandparents and opportunity for grandparents to talk to them and they listen to them because most of them are bilingual and they they can communicate even if they are in Pakistan or India, they use technology to communicate them. So they do little interviews there as well. Because we are in, in, a, in a girls' school, we talk a lot about gender and the uh, inequalities and uh, very uh, kind of, uh, at the moment, very, very important for them to understand kind of their relationship, especially because they are in a, in a same-sex uh, school. Now, this is my class and the kind of, they have, they have done presentation, the assembly for the whole year group. So in, in each year you have 224 students uh, in each year and they present and they were very confident. And I was just standing on, on side and, and admiring their confidence that grew by the end of the, end of the year. And so 
At the moment, I am combining this group with another, and I completely forgot on Tuesday we had the meetings. So Tuesday lunchtime we had meetings, and I told them we had uh, about 25 year 12 students, which are 17 years of age, who came to join us and wanted to be part of this. So I'm hoping that this is going to become something very popular in a school, and we are turning it into uh, anthropology uh, society. When I started teaching um, anthropology in 2010 at Pre University setting, there were very few uh, textbooks. A part of Joy's book and Thomas Hill and Erickson book, there weren't many around that we can use for our teaching. At the moment, there are so many different places that are that we can use for uh, teaching students from any age. So these are some of the examples. I don't know if you are familiar, for example, Sapien started recently, perhaps five, six months ago with a teaching section where you can find lots of uh, information. Um, and uh, for example, why we pause and support social media, uh, UCL has an uh, example of, uh, of free resources. So there is a wealth of resources that you can find around um, that, that you can use for, for, teaching, to, for teaching students. So I kind of uh, choose depending on, on a topic, depending what is happening on a, uh, in a society that we discuss and talk. For example, when there was a, a war between uh, Israel and uh, Palestine recently, there was a big kind of commo emotional commotion in my school and we had to talk about it. This is the, the uh, there was opportunity to to talk about and, and express our feelings, how how we feel about. Um, another opportunity that we always take our students is London Anthropology Day that happens. Emma, you, Emma used to organize it uh, up to this year um, in June, um, where there is a range of universities and students who come to uh, have a taste of what anthropology is about. Discovery anthropology, almost now uh, traditional to find more information about uh, anthropology and kind of to be a starting point for uh, future generations to, to learn about. I'm sorry, but I have to plug my book a little bit here and talk about uh, when I started teaching in 2010, there was not this kind of specific um, textbook for the pre-university students and uh, Laura and Laura Pontney and I were um, principal examiners at the uh, AQA exam board writing exam papers so we accumulated lots of resources over the years and decided to uh, to write this text but now now in the second edition so first one is 2015 it came uh, this year in May and if anybody is interested, the chapters are set so you can use them actually to, to set up the course and to teach with lots of examples and lots of, hopefully, for everybody, informative ethnographies. I think we have about 250 to 300 ethnographies included there. So this is, I, I just wanted to give you a little flavor of where I am at the moment with and how I am using this Trojan horse approach as Emma suggested because, and I'm lucky that my head teacher is really open-minded when I mention, uh, I, I worked in another school uh, for 16 years before I came here. And when I was coming, I said, one condition to come is to introduce a level anthropology and she was supportive from, from the beginning. And this kind of allowed me to kind of, properly start and, 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 and teach anthropology. Um, so it has to be environment that is, but, but whatever environment it is, young people are very open-minded and, and, and willing to learn new things. I'll finish this by saying that what I notice, whether it's anthropology society that I run or teaching my A-level anthropology is that you can see the transformation and change the students go from the first time that they never kind of heard about anthropology, empathy, open-mindedness, and less judgmental people that we turn them into. 
So thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, I, I would be happy to answer. Um, so thank you for listening. Thank you, Tomislav. And, and, and please don't apologize for plugging the book. It, it really is very good and available from all good booksellers and from Amazon. Um, if that's thank you. Not such a good bookseller, but more convenient for people. Um, uh, Thomas, I've just a, a quick question for me. Um, I'm, I'm just interested how many of your A-level students and, um, and indeed members of the Anthropology Club go on to study anthropology at university and what could universities do to encourage people in, in secondary schools and colleges to go on and, and join them at, at degree level? Uh, I can give you a really uh, good statistical historical kind of overview because I'm in charge of sixth form in my school and have been in, in most of my uh, um, teaching life. And I remember before 2010, there was maybe one or two students that I was aware considering to take anthropology at university. Once we started teaching A-level, I had almost three or four students each year from my classes that would go to study further. And at the present moment, um, we have one or two because they become familiar with the anthropology society and then they become more curious and then I make them connect them with either SOAS or UCL or Brunel University. And as I said before, um, anthropologists from every university were so supportive. I mean, I would, I remember Joy coming to my class and uh, sharing with my students uh, her field work and uh, it was really, really exciting time. So more and more, once they are exposed to anthropology, once they realize what subject is about, Thank you. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, we're now sort of moving into, we finished our final presentations and now moving into the second part of, of the webinar, which allows us to open up um, to, to everyone. Uh, I think we have about 60 people here today. Um, so if anyone would like to ask a question or, or simply um, to share experiences or enter into the conversation, you can do so either by posting a question in the chat, if you just put question at the start of it, uh, you can do that directly to me and I can ask it on your behalf or you can you can ask it in the chat and I'll read it out uh, or you can raise your hand as well um, or using the I think you go to the reactions button and there's a raise hand there. Um, I can see one hand raised, but what I was going to su suggest is if there's anyone um, I'm going to prioritize anyone that is currently studying anthropology at a pre-university level um, in a school or college. So if there are any students out there, um, then alert me uh, through maybe through the chat and I'm, you will absolutely get um, priority. I'm going to start. Uh, can um, Charles, do you want to unmute yourself? And if you have any questions or, or perspectives you want to share. Uh, thank you, Richard, and I want to thank all the presenters for the very fascinating ideas on how to introduce anthropology at the very basic level. I'm an anthropologist uh, uh, talking from Kenya. Uh, I, I know one of the most important considerations of students whenever they go for further studies is the consideration of the possibilities of what the future holds for them. And uh, I think a lot of times this is a question that comes up and again either for our students or even for students studying uh, disciplines that are very, not very traditional. I don't know, Kevin and Tom, Tomislav, your experience, whether these kind of questions come right from students at the high school level, or maybe it's sort of a question that comes much later at the university level. Thank you. Uh, sorry, can you just repeat it again? Sorry, sorry, I was uh, distracting. Uh, sorry, uh, it's my pleasure again. I was asking that most of the time, even students studying anthropology in, let's say, Kenya or those I've interacted with within the African context, one of the major questions has always been the functional nature of the discipline. What is likely to be the outcome? What will I do thereafter? What kind of jobs will, will we be getting into? And I was asking whether these kind of questions come right from high school level or whether they are more often than not university level questions. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. Sorry about it. Um, this is very important, not only for students, but also for their parents. In, in the UK, before you decide to take 
uh, last two years, which is called A levels, you need to choose the subject that will take you to university and also to the job for the future. So the big important influence for students and for parents, their parents more than students saying, what can I do when I finish degree in anthropology? And somehow uh, I think anthropology is very important to whatever branch or field that you want to do in the future. So I'm trying to explain to them, if you are working with the people, any job that you have working with the people, you need anthropology. Why? Because you need un to understand the environment that you are in. You need to understand the culture that you are in. So within that, you have to explain to them or, or to some parents, because depending what what parents want them for, for students, whether they you want to go, even if you want to go into medicine or dentistry, you need you can use medical anthropology, you can use some aspects of it. So it's a good question. And it's, it is something that students choose. Now, I think they are, when anthropology started as an A-level in, in secondary schools, not many people, not even teachers were familiar what anthropology was. So it took us a while to explain what it was. So let alone students. So you need to put lots of kind of effort and, and explain to them that there is a future with anthropology and it's very, very valuable um, uh, degree. So I, I think, um, um, Tomislav, you've, you've mentioned the very practical and real uh, routes into work there, but you, I mean, you also talked about um, empathy and open-mindedness um, that anthropology uh, can provide. Kevin, uh, do you have a response for, for Charles? And I think Joy as well also. I, I think Charles asks a very sensible question. Um, in England, um, I, I, I like Thomas Lab saying we, we have about four or five students who go off and read social anthropology at university every year. Uh, most of those students want to go into things like working for charities, international charities. Uh, a lot of them want to go in for work with, um, for example, the United Nations. Uh, they want to work for government in the foreign office. Uh, and some of them end up by in being employed by companies as well, so that they're doing research on, for example, marketing and so on. But most of them have got a, a passion for changing the world for the better. So most of them are interested in going into either international charities like Oxfam or whatever, or working for government or working for international organisations. That's been my experience in England, certainly. Mm. Join. I think you had your hand up. Yes, did I you... did. Sorry. No, I was just going to say that um, in response to that question, we convinced the Scottish Qualifications Authority to offer anthropology by making a list of the ways in which students who'd studied it would benefit in their application for jobs in a whole range of, of um, possibilities because the Scottish um, economy includes lots of people who come from other countries and work with other countries and we just listed them all and that was one of the things that convinced them to do it so we very much were thinking about that <clears throat> yeah Charles can I, can I ask you in, in you mentioned you, you you teach anthropology in Kenya um, is it only taught at universities in Kenya or is it also taught in schools and colleges thank you Richard I think anthropology in Kenya is uh, the very first time you get in contact with real anthropology is at the university level. Mm. And uh, majorly, I think the, the fears and the misconceptions of what anthropology is, is completely very huge. Mm. You know, anthro study of anthropods, you know, talk about specifically archeological excavation. So the knowledge at the very high school level is completely very limited. Uh, and part of the problem is that uh, we've tried our level best to be able to change that narrative. And unfortunately, most of the anthropologists who come to enjoy anthropology are those who stick to the discourse because later they realize that uh, it provides a whole, you know, plethora of opportunities and the holistic nature gives a lot of room for you. The flexibility is, is beyond reproach, actually. I can mm. see even my colleague Eric Nyambeda uh, who we teach anthropology alongside the universities in Kenya is on board and I think that has been pretty good for us. Thank you Charles, thank, thank you for your question but also for your, for your answer. 
Um, and um, can I just point out this, this um, session has been recorded, but so have all the other sessions in this webinar series. So they will show many of the very real world practical examples of anthropologists who've gone on from studying anthropology at university uh, or in school um, and gone to work in, in international development or in medicine um, and uh, on, on influencing parliaments and policy making, working in Westminster. Um, so as policymakers there. So do check out those, those videos and I hope that would be a useful resource as well uh, to convince um, worried parents or inspire students to, to study anthropology. Um, Hilary, uh, Hilary Callan, you've had your hand up for some time. Do you want to, uh, yes, join us, thank you, hi. Hi. Yes. Hi, Hilary. Hi. Um, hello colleagues, hello everyone. Um, I should explain that um, I was director of the REI at the time of the um, lead up to our design of the um, A-level, which has been, has been mentioned. Um, and I think that what I've got here is uh, more of a comment than a question. Um, I'm very struck by Emma's uh, image of the Trojan horse. Um, when we were beginning to work on uh, anthropology um, in education, as, to use uh, Emma's phrase, um, we did certainly look at Trojan horse methods of injecting some anthropology into the teaching of other subjects, but our, our primary concern at that time um, was to find a way of fitting the teaching of anthropology into existing curricular structures, uh, you know, hence the, the prominence that we gave to the A-level. As everybody has said, um, everyone was hugely, hugely disappointed and miserable when the A-level was um, discontinued. But I think that um, one of the possible part consequences of losing the A-level um, is that um, there's come to be a great deal more um, emphasis on uh, innovative um, and creative ways um, of actually um, you know, having Trojan horses. Um, and so some, many of these have been uh, mentioned um, in the seminar um, so far. Um, I would suggest that it's uh, more of a generalized historical process, um, both for education and for anthropology, though perhaps we, we recognize. Um, people may be familiar um, with um, Thomas Highlander Erickson's now classic uh, 2006 book on uh, public presence of anthropology. I think that one of the consequences of the ways in which anthropology is being introduced in various ways um, into uh, uh, both educational environments and more public environments, for example, by the um, Policy and Practice Committee, but elsewhere in the world as well. I think that um, this is likely to have uh, feedback effects within anthropology itself. And we may be becoming uh, very much more aware as anthropologists of both the necessity and the ways in which we can uh, modify, uh, revise, um, improve perhaps, and refine um, our way of thinking and talking anthropology um, in ways that actually make sense to people who are not anthropologists. So I would see a connection both with what's happening for uh, anthropology in education and a synergy, uh, um, certainly in the UK, with the Policy and Practice Committee in that we are likely to see quite important uh, changes happening within the discourses of anthropology itself. So I think, I think um, that's the comment I'd make at this stage. Thank you. Thanks, Hilary. Yes, I, I, comments absolutely are, are welcome. I, you know, I see this in a way as it's more important that we have conversations rather than you know, straightforward questions and answers. Um, I mean, Hilary and Joy, I think you both sort of mentioned there is sort of a disciplinary lack of confidence, you know, that anthropologists don't put themselves forward. Um, we, we have, we're passionate about the discipline, but maybe don't think of it in quite the same way, you know, as a bounded discipline or as anthropologist as an identity. Um, and I wonder if that's something we should be more confident about, or is that one of the, the actual, the better things about anthropology that um, we, we can move around between disciplines and inform others in conversation? I, I think we should be more confident actually, because um, it's, I often meet people who talk to me in a way that makes me think they are really an anthropologist but they don't know it they haven't realized <laughs> and I just wish we could give the word a more positive uh, spin uh, one uh, some of your earlier seminars that I've attended I was quite sad because people working in government would say 
you know, I'm using my anthropology, but I don't mention the word because people don't like it or people, you know, aren't impressed. I think Emma, who is there, might remember that on one occasion I commented on it. But um, I, I'm, I'm even uh, at the moment involved in writing a novel about which in which a person becomes an anthropologist. I'm trying to make it really exciting so that it will <laughs> encourage anyone, if I ever get it published, to see what a good job it is. <laughs> mm. Hilary, did you want to come back to that as well? Really, to agree with Joy, but also perhaps to ask uh, Emma, um, you know, what I've just um, been talking about is very much from a UK perspective, but uh, Emma and the IUA, IOAS um, committee has, has a much broader international perspective, and I wonder what your comment might be on whether we are actually getting better at communicating anthropology within educational frameworks, but also more widely. Um, how does that vary in your experience? Um, in you know the different parts of the world in, in, in which um, uh, anthropology is being is, be, is being practiced, and I think there's a link there also, of course, with with Kevin and the IB um, and the range of countries in which the IB is taught. What kinds of variations are there in how good or bad <laughs> we are at disseminating anthropological ideas um, to non-anthropological audiences or or, or indeed pre-university audiences? So I think that's a very interesting question. I actually, before the webinar, was thinking, can I give you know a packaged summary of these are all the countries where anthropology is taught in schools, and here it is in anthropology clubs. And it's actually quite a tricky thing to sum up succinctly, because as I showed in that map at the beginning, there's all these different kinds of ways that anthropology can be taught and learned. And it might be in a school, but not called anthropology. It might be in a textbook. So I know from some of the uh, congresses we've had, people have said, well, actually, Marinovsky's in our textbook for social sciences. It's not anthropology, but he's in there. Um, so it's quite difficult to sum up. But my answer would be, if you're interested in this, please join the commission. We've got lots more conversations coming up about it. So um, yeah, I, I also know that knowledge that I had two years ago may already be out of date because things shift quite quickly sometimes. But yes, join the commission and find out more. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Hilary. Um, Joy, the point you made about some people being more anthropological in the, in the way they think, um, I always think that children are incredibly anthropological. They're incredibly open-minded. They're interested in indifference and otherness. They like to ask questions, which adults maybe won't because they feel they're being nosy or intrusive. Um, and maybe children also don't think in quite as, as bounded ways where we, we, you know, and adults will tend to put things in boxes. Um, so again, I think, you know, get them while they're young. Um, is maybe an argument we should make. Um, thank you, Hilary. Uh, Geetika, do you want to um, unmute yourself and join? Uh, good evening, everybody. I am an anthropologist based in New Delhi, an independent researcher. And um, I'm very, very happy to be a part of this discussion which is very very interesting and uh, my sort of question was that you know as a student of anthropology one of the things that the discipline gives us is a certain kind of perspective about the world and uh, that perspective is uh, could be in terms of as you know panelists have spoken here about living with difference and um, i also find this to very interesting because when I look at my son's uh, teaching in grade one, I see how concepts of difference, diversity, etc. Either the popularity of the discipline. Geetika, I think we've we've lost you there. Hi. I, I think the, the your internet connection was a bit bit slow. It is not as much as other social science.
So, um, Geetika, I think we've 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 lost you. I don't know if anyone would like to answer or speak to Geetika's point uh, about anthropological perspectives. Or I would suggest Geetika, if you if you can hear me, if you want to post a chat the question in the chat, um, that might be one way of of uh, of asking the question. I'm sorry, Geetika, it's really quite difficult to hear you. I'm going to move on. We have a question in the chat. Um, which is about, um, this is from, uh, well, the question is, what are the chances? I think this is a question maybe to, to Joy. Because and... it is difficult uh, for anthropology to have a relation of instrumentality. Geetika, can you hear me? We, we, we actually had some difficulty hearing your question. You, you cut out in the middle there and it was quite slowed down. Um, so what I'm going to suggest, if you could put your question in the chat, and I'll put it to the the rest of the panel, I think that might be the best the best thing to do. We do have a question uh, that's come through the chat, which is, what are the chances of the anthropology A level being reintroduced, and what's the situation what's the situation like in countries outside the UK? And I think uh, Kevin and Emma maybe can speak to that. Are other countries planning on introducing Ooh, anthropology no. in secondary schools? So, Emma and Kevin, would you like to speak to that? Emma, um, after Emma. you. Emma, you go ahead. So, sure. So, I know, for example, that in upper secondary school in Norway, anthropology is taught as a subject, and it has been for quite a few years. Um, obviously, as Kevin will talk about in the International Baccalaureate, there are schools all over the world offering social and cultural anthropology, the diploma programme. Um, but beyond that, I know that there are lots of efforts going on. So I, obviously Kevin needs to speak next, but I would also encourage those members of the commission who are up to things to also raise their hands to tell us about it. Does anyone else have any, any information on this, any sort of behind the scenes maneuvering? Um, I believe it was Michael Gove that um, was the education secretary at the time, and I believe his um, special advisor Dominic Cummins was was not keen on on anthropology. He much prefers big data. Um, uh, Richard, sure I don't where... know if you can, you can hear me. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. yes I, I can help. So it's David Jenkins speaking. Oh, hi, David. Uh, hi. How uh, are you? Uh, thank you very well. Of course, I've been listening to these marvelous presentations with with great interest and fascination. To, to speak specifically to to try to answer a little bit the question that was asked about the future. Um, we, we will try to do our best to work out some qualification which will fit the void that the A-level has um, precipitated. The key question is that none of the exam boards will take on an A-level in anthropology, unfortunately. So the AQA's um, act of sabotage or uh, deliberate destruction really, unfortunately, wasn't so shocking to the other exam boards that they want to be sympathetic and take it up as a fully blown school qualification, which of course is very disappointing. Um, indeed, uh, one board, I probably shouldn't give the name, um, just said, oh, we had done the same thing, um, which is, yeah, which is very depressing. But anyway, um, we are though um, uh, hoping very much that, that we can do something through an RAI teaching and learning platform. And uh, the reason why that's so terribly relevant is that we've actually advertised for an education officer who will help the education committee, which of course, of which of course, Joy and Thomas are members, uh, to implement this, this, this new initiative. Now, what we can't claim is that it will be a new A-level, that would be absurd. But what we can claim is that we will try to provide systematic guided learning to people of school age. Um, uh, in such a way that it's helpful um, for the understanding of A-level at the preschool level. Um, so um, please do go to the REI website. And um, uh, so, and if, if you're a fellow, you would have received the advertisement and circulate the advertisement for that new officer as widely as you possibly can. Because if we get exactly the right person, then perhaps we will, have, with the help of course of, 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 of the education committee, perhaps we will in the next couple of years, move towards filling this gap substantially. So obviously this is a very practical and I hope uh, positive uh, way forward. Uh, thank you very much. 
And thank you, David. That's a really comprehensive um, and an answer. And I think probably you're the best person to actually answer that as someone who was involved in, in um, the anthropology A level and as director of the RAI. And also, um, on, uh, you, you work with, with Emma, of course, on the, um, on the Commission on Anthropology and Education with IUAES. Um, so should we move on? We've got a lot of questions coming in now. So if we move on to Eric, who I think you're, you're calling in from, from Kenya. Is that right, Eric? Yes, yes, that's right. Um, hi, Eric. Hi. Hi, how are you? All good. Yes, yes. Um, I just wanted to add on to what Charles had said earlier about anthropology in Kenya and how it is introduced. I think um, what Charles has said is true. And I just wanted to add that, um, of course, we uh, in uh, secondary school syllabus, I don't know whether that has changed, but uh, there was a topic in history uh, in the secondary schools talking about anthropology, I think just introducing what anthropology is at secondary school level. Uh, if you talk to students, uh, if we talk to some of the students coming from high schools to universities and those particularly who have done history, uh, history they will tell you that uh, they have heard about uh, anthropology but not much depth of it. But during our time, uh, Charles and myself, we would associate anthropology with the works of Zinja Anthropas and uh, things like that. And uh, most of us wouldn't know. Uh, maybe we were more familiar with archeology span because we studied uh, Zinja Anthropas and things like that. So that is the first impression that we, we had when we joined the universities to do anthropology. But that um, maybe has changed for students taking history, but history is not compulsory. So there would be few students doing that. And maybe some of them, few of them would end up in, in, in anthropology department. Now, um, also in the now slowly and slowly, anthropology is get, gaining some recognition in health sector. Um, I think medical training colleges in the country I've talked to some students who are attending medical training colleges. They'll tell you that uh, they are also introduced to anthropology uh, at uh, that level. These are students not going to the university, but uh, uh, doing diploma courses in uh, tertiary institutions, particularly medical training colleges. Now, that one I've had, but um, we are yet to know what is really told, talk, taught to them in terms of anthropology at that level, that is not very clear to us even as we speak. And uh, right now, uh, of course, uh, in the university where we teach anthropology, you would find, uh, for instance, now I'm personally conducting classes for a one-off class for fifth-year medical students who are, uh, who are remaining with one year to graduate from medical schools in several uh, universities in the country, including Nairobi, uh, um, uh, Jomo Kenyatta, Maseno, Kenyatta University, uh, where we are teaching them anthropological methods uh, of research and things like that. So there is a, a, a funded project. But also I was looking at um, the syllabus for various courses, for instance, public health in Maseno University. We have a specific course on medical anthropology uh, taught in the Department of uh, Public Health. And um, I was also looking at uh, the courses that are taught in the uh, Department of Botany, and I saw that they are teaching uh, ecological anthropology, they are teaching cultural anthropology to their students, they are also teaching uh, ethnobotany or things like that, which are very much related. So that was just to add on to what uh, Charles had said, based on uh, his experience, which I totally agree with. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, thanks for, for adding uh, adding that. And it's really good to hear that you know the, the discipline is is achieving such reach in Kenya. Um, I'm going to suggest to the panel if you want to look through the chat and if there's any questions uh, that have been raised there that you'd like to answer. Uh, and um, we have several more questions coming up. Uh, Sabine and I think was it Ahmed also had his hand up, but put it down. But Sabine and then Gio Giovanna. Maybe should we, Sabine? Would you like to okay. ask your question? Should I start? Hi. Yes. Can you yes, hear me? Yes, please. Yes. Hi. Okay. I can hear you. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thanks from my side to to all the speakers and in particular to Thomas Leff, who just joined us in Tübingen, and he gave one of his inspiring talks to our students in my class, anthropology in schools. 
And of course, they did a good job, not least because of your, uh, <laughs> your tips and hints you gave them. Um, the situation we have in Germany is, as probably in many other countries, that there is no anthropological subject, no anthropology as a subject. It's not present in schools. It's not allowed. And it's much more difficult than it is in England because it, um, the, the states of the Federation are independent as far as education is concerned. So if you want to introduce it, we, I would have to go through 16 administrations other than <laughs> not like joy, just one, you know, I, I would have to go through all these administrations. I don't know, I don't think that I will survive this process because introducing a new subject in Germany, it takes forever to do this. But what we do is one thing is we um, we go to schools and give them an insight, just an idea of what anthropology is, and they usually uh, give us the chance to at least present it for one day. Um, and at, currently, we are trying to sneak into other subjects rather than persuading um, other teachers like biologists or, or historians to teach anthropology as well. It would I think, uh, from what I learned now, it's much more, it's better to have anthropologists in, in schools who are anthropologists, and then for some, somehow try to get into it, if only with a couple of hours. But what my colleague Nora and I found out that it's good to be in schools for a certain period of time, uh, and students, as uh, one of you said, I think having students are always fascinating. You know, you can always talk about anthropology with them. But then we are leaving school. Uh, and then if they get the idea, oh, the world is so beautiful and colorful, great. That's good to start with, but it's not enough. I mean, if we want to get to the point to say we need more respect for each other, we need more to learn about the differences, what is culture, why is it so important to every single one of us, uh, we would need more time to spend on that. Uh, so I would like to ask you and maybe the colleagues here in the room, whether you have any experiences on long term uh, school teaching, is teaching anthropology, and what does it do? I know that Thomas was talking about it, and, and we have seen it at your school, you know, students are always getting this, um, this image, oh, the anthros are coming and they, ha they, they have a special attitude. But do you know that there are about any evaluations of long-term education and anthropological education? So that is one question I have. And the second is, I would be interesting to, to put it on a European level to start with, let's say, getting away from the national anthropological sections uh, and work on material on a European level, because I think anthropology is really nothing nationalized, something you, you, you can use only in one particular context. We could have books on that using on a European level if we adapt them uh, to the schools, to the countries, and also to the age. There was one question in the chat, can we also use it for the kindergarten and for the, the first grades? Yes, we just went there. Uh, you can do it, but you have to adapt to the material and the class to the little ones. They are, they find it great, absolutely. They are so open, but uh, you need a lot of experience to do that in different age grades. So my, these are my two questions. So maybe some of them you would like to comment on this or would be interested, and then we could think of how to create a European project out of this. I can answer or have a comment on that first point. Uh, sorry, the second point about um, very young children. I, I went into my um, daughter's school to give a talk about my recent field work in India, and the teacher afterwards described it as being a slow motion car crash. Um, on the first point, I'm hoping it didn't have any long term damaging effects on the children, at least it certainly did on me. Um, but on the on the sort of longer term impacts of teaching anthropology in schools, Emma or, or Joy or, or David, if you want to um, rejoin us, um, I don't know if you know anything about studies of, of or you know the anthropology um, of education and the value of that long term. Um, Joy, you look. Like oh, you sorry, to... I was going to speak about anthropology in primary school, which is one of the questions that the other one. 
that you wrote. Well, it would be good to hear about that. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, um, when we were discussing introducing anthropology in secondary schools in Scotland, um, there was a discussion in Aberdeen University with somebody who I think I mentioned to you called um, Liz Curtis, and she said at the meeting, "We do teach anthropology in primary schools in Scotland. We teach about other people. We teach religious education. We just don't call it." Um, anthropology and I know that in my kids school they did um, there was one particular teacher who was teaching anthropology she didn't call it anthropology either but she talked about other cultures and other people and other ways of thinking and funnily enough her daughter came to study at Oxford Brooks and did anthropology with me so it was quite a nice way that they brought it on through so I think it a lot depends on the teachers but certainly um, in primary school it's a as you said before, children are very open and interested in all sorts of ways of thinking. So yeah, that, that was my comment really. And with the European context, um, well, as you know, Sabina, we've spoken already about this. It would be nice to get our students to be in touch with each other and talk to each other um, with regard to the European context. I think the Scottish units are, uh, are taught in not the anthropology ones yet, but the SQA has things that are taught in China. I don't know about other parts of Europe at the moment, but um, I hope we could do that. That'd be great. <clears throat> thank you, Joy, and thank you, Sabina. Um, Emma, did you want to say something? Just very briefly, I wanted to talk about the sweetest example I've heard of teaching young children anthropology. So uh, a colleague, Ricardo, from Mexico, told me all about a puppet show that was being run. And so this was for very young children. And it was all about um, kind of creating their first fieldwork diary, but there was lots of drawing. But I mean, it really shows you that I think sometimes we can forget that there are different forms, different forms of communication that you can use to introduce anthropological ideas. You don't need to go vastly into depth about something if that's not appropriate for that age group. But there are many creative ways of engaging with all sorts of learners. Thank you, Emma. I wish someone had said that to me before I went to my, my daughter's school. Um, <laughs> uh, we are running out of time, always with these sessions. I wish we had longer, um, but I'm going to, so we have Giovanna, but before Giovanna, you ask your question. Could I ask Abigail? Um, I think you're, you're, I'm seeing in the chat that you'd like to speak. So if you would, if you're there, would you like to unmute yourself and, and ask your question? Hello, I'm calling from Israel. Hi. Um, <laughs> breaking our holiest day in order to be on this uh, chat. Um, and, um, uh, I've been teaching anthropology for uh, 32 years now. Uh, I can say that I teach from kindergarten to uh, graduate school. I teach on every level that there is. But again, also like everywhere else in Israel, uh, it is not a subject that's registered in the school system. I, uh, they have like, I started because they had something called a magnet school uh, type thing where they had like um, every school had a different subject that they focused on and they decided that anthropology would be one of them and asked me to start teaching anthropology. This was 32 years ago. I'm still teaching. I'm teaching in a gifted children's program because that's another way that you can teach anthropology in Israel. And there's many gifted children programs in Israel that do teach anthropology. Um, it, it's not, uh, it can't, some high schools do have anthropology, but most of them don't have it on a regular basis. But any student that wants to do their final project in high school in anthropology can do it. Um, and uh, on the kindergarten level, it's obviously not something that's you know, it's something that you're asked to come in and, and do. But um, again, anthropology uh, taught on very different levels. There's a lot of creativity involved because you have to apply uh, the, the knowledge in some, on so many different levels. Um, and of course, uh, graduate school and undergraduate school, it's, uh, it's easier because it's something that's already established. Um, but uh, I just want to, Say that it's possible to do it if you have individual schools that are open to it. You don't have to go to uh, the Ministry of Education and you know have it become something that's you know established. 
you can anthropologists can find a way of introducing anthropology and call it anthropology. I remember there was a big argument with one of the teachers. She goes, we can't call it anthropology because the word's too big for children to say. And um, I said, yes, they can learn the word anthropology. And then uh, one of the little children afterwards came came to me and she goes, I heard you, talk, you talking to my teacher. And she goes, right, we can say the word anthropology. We know how to say the word anthropology. And this was a third grader. And so of course the word saying anthropology and calling it anthropology is important um, and not calling it, um, you know, learning about peoples or folk, folk uh, I don't know, whatever it is. I can't translate the Hebrew into English right now. But anyway, the idea is that you can fit it into the school system in lots of different ways. And somebody mentioned, I can't remember who, uh, saying, um, oh, what did she say? Uh, now that anthropology being taught by anthropologists is obviously the best way to to introduce, introduce the subject uh, better than having teachers adapt it, you know, adopt it. Uh, if, so, if, so there is, and getting back to somebody else's question about what, um, you know, what can you do with anthropology, uh, teaching anthropology to children and not waiting till they get to university to be introduced to the subject is, uh, is incredibly important. I don't have to explain to any of you. Uh, I've got lots more to say, but I've said enough. Yeah. Thank you, Abigail. And, and it's it's really good to hear um, that you know you have been uh, promoting anthropology in in Israel. Um, and, and I think that's one of the things that's come up in this in this session is how widespread teaching anthropology is. Um, but as you said, you know we have the word for it, but we also have differences in meanings, and there are different cultures and different understandings of anthropology. Um, I think Eric and, and Charles. Um, um, you know, the, there may be a difference in the, the colonial context, of course, uh, and the experience in, in Kenya of what anthropology is and what it means. Um, Germany and the, and, and, uh, and the UK would obviously have very different uh, understandings and experiences, which also speaks to um, the confidence and, and, a, and the way people understand and approach anthropology. I think we have time for one more question, and um, I'm going to invite Giovanna, if, if you would like to ask a question, but can I ask you to be fairly brief, and then we'll just have um, maybe everyone on the panel could sum up in a word or phrase what students will gain from some, uh, from studying anthropology. So Giovanna. So uh, very quickly, I, I want you all to show the, um, what is happening in, in Italy. Uh, so uh, we have uh, um, anthropology uh, taught to teachers uh, who needed to enter in schools and teach for their teaching qualifications they have to, uh, they need to have credits and this is officially um, done uh, with a, uh, an agreement with the ministry of education and then uh, we uh, we have anthropology in uh, uh, the lycée in secondary schools uh, in uh, human sciences uh, um, lycée but it's in a big area of four or five hours a week. Anthropology is taught together with the sociology and psychology and pedagogy, but they have four or five hours a week. Then in primary schools, they give hints about anthropology together with the history and geography and social, other social human sciences. And we use also what Emma called the Trojan subjects, for example, citizenship, training in, in Europe, and this is done in all levels from kindergarten to secondary schools. That's all. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, the um, uh, wonderful insight uh, we, uh, we had uh, uh, this afternoon. Uh, thank you to uh, uh, Kevin, uh, Tomislava, Joy, and uh, Emma. Thank, thank you, Giovanna. Um, I don't know if any of the panel have want to respond to questions that have come up in the chat. Um, I know, Emma, you've been answering some of them in the chat yourself, so thank you for that. It's hard to um, to keep up with hands being raised and um, chat uh, questions coming in, but I, I do apologise for anyone that's asked a question and we haven't had time 
um, to answer it. Um, and as I say, these these sessions, unfortunately, don't we don't ever have enough time, but we do have to finish strictly at five o'clock. So I'm, I'm just going to finish by asking the panel, uh, perhaps in reverse order from the way we went before, um, to sum up in a phrase or word. I'm taking this from you, Kevin. Um, this was what you did with your students. Um, so if you can inflict it on your students, I, I'm going to inflict it on the panel. If you could sum up in a phrase or word, what, what is the one, the most valuable thing that the students will gain from studying anthropology in school or college? So, okay, I'll start. Uh, so one word is empathy, I would say. You've got a good word there, Thomas Laugh. Um, Kevin. Um, I agree with empathy totally. Um, our motto here is vive la différence. Difference, appreciation of difference. Yeah, yeah. Um, Joy? Um, I think a kind of enlightenment for the students. And I would just like to say very briefly that I'm really pleased to see that Carol Hunter, who encouraged us to introduce anthropology in Scottish schools because she works for the Scottish Qualifications Authority, is in the audience. Thanks for coming, Carol, and thanks for all your support. Emma knows. And thank you, Joy. Uh, finally, Emma, um, slightly unfair because you, you've, um, you've you, someone might have stolen the word you wanted to say. They might have got in there first, but I don't know if you have a different word. So my word would be questioning. So questioning things we've taken for granted, questioning ideas we thought were true for everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Okay, well, uh, all that remains for me to do is to to thank the panel, Thomas Laff, Kevin, Joy and Emma. It's been um, a really interesting discussion. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, can I also uh, thank everyone that, that uh, has participated and, and asked questions and contributed and um, to um, Catherine and Hanine at the RAI who as ever provide wonderful support behind the scenes and um, we really do appreciate all your efforts. Um, we'll be back not in October, but I'm hoping in November. Um, write to me if you have any suggestions for future sessions you'd like to see, but we'll hope to be back in November for another session of the RAI Anthropology Communicates series. So thank you all very much and, um, and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, thank, you. thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, bye Joy. Thanks, Thomas. Bye. 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 Thank you, everybody. Also from thank the RAI. You.